everybody. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Oh my goodness, I don't think I've talked to a crowd of students this big since before the pandemic. So you have all made my day with your energy. I love it. So hands for you guys. So while we're working on getting our slides up there, I'm just going to give you an overview about what we are going to be talking about today. And that's chasing stars and defying gravity. Well, what does that mean? So basically, I didn't get here from nowhere. I start off just like all of you. And by just like all of you, I mean I had no idea that it was even possible to have a career that literally took me to space. And in that career, I have been able to work on amazing projects, work along incredible people, and actually make history with the work that we have done. And so today is all about telling you how in the world I made that happen and what we're doing today. So hopefully we're almost there. We're getting the slides ready. I also got some of your questions earlier. I'm excited to hopefully go through them during the talk. But there is going to be a chance for you to ask questions at the end. So if you have a question, try to remember it, keep it in your head. And when I'm done, I love to take your questions from you too. And we're getting close. This one's really promising. <laughs> oh! <laughs> very nice, very nice. <laughs> okay. I got my clicker. We're plugging in the sound. And we're going into full screen mode. So we should be ready for action. All right, let's get started, everybody. to read books. 
Oh, so maybe I'll be a writer. I was a big fan of math and science too, so an engineer sounded all right as well. But the, the point was, I didn't know. So when I was in middle school, and I went to high school, I realized that I didn't know wasn't the answer that people were expecting from me anymore. Well, where do you want to go to college? I don't know. Uh, what do you want to study when you get to school? I'm not really sure. Like, am I supposed to already know this already? And the answer is you don't have to, because I didn't. So during this time, I started to get a lot of mail delivered to my house. Tons of mail, mail. Coming from colleges and universities, telling me all about their programs. Oh, come to our school. In Nebraska, we've got this amazing English program. Come over to our school here. We've got this amazing math program. There were so many letters that it overwhelmed me to the point where I started to take them and put them in a box underneath my bed. And I just kept adding them there. I was like, I don't know what to do with these. And so one day I came home from school and it was the same story. I got some mail, I took a look at it. This is all nice. And I had run out of room under my bed, so I decided that I was just gonna start throwing them away. And that's what I was gonna do, throw it away. I'm going over to the trash bin, with this pamphlet in my hand, and right as I'm about to let it go in the trash, my mom looks at me and says, Jeff, what are you doing? I'm like, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm throwing this in the trash. And she says, uh-uh, no, not that one. That is a good school. And what was the school? The Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. How many of you heard of MIT? because I had no idea what an MIT was. But the way my mom explained it to me, MIT was this world-renowned school known for its incredible engineering and sciences. And whenever they come to our work, we roll out the red carpet for them. I was like, okay, whatever. So what is this pamphlet all about? We take a look, and it's talking about a summer program. And it's a summer program where if you get accepted, you don't have to pay for anything. It's completely free. And you get to learn for eight weeks alongside 60 other students from all over America. And by the end, you can say that you've done some studies at MIT and maybe got a little closer to figuring out the answer to those questions of what do I want to be when I grow up? So my mom said, you're applying to this. And I said, OK, mom. You know, I had track and cross country. I did sports. I already had a lot on my plates, but I got that application in, hit send the night before it was due, and totally forgot about it. That's until one of my classmates asked me a few months later, what are you guys doing this summer? And I said, oh, I'm gonna run across country. That's what I do every summer. And I said, oh, wait, but I applied to this program. I said, I have this school called MIT, if you've heard of it. And he said, heard of it? MIT, do you realize how hard it is to get into that school? Like, what do you mean? He said, nobody gets into MIT. So that night, I went online and I looked up and he was not lying. The last year, how many people from the state of New Jersey, that's where I grew up, did they admit into this program? One. I said, oh, well, going to go home, tell my mom, I told you so. It was a waste of my time. But then that spring, when my mom told me I needed to come home for practice early, I was like, why? And I pulled to the driveway, and she's holding this package. She's like, okay, oh, open it, turn on my tea. I'm like, mom, stop getting your hopes up. She's like, Joe, why would they send you a big package to tell you you did not get in? I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Congratulations, you're going to MIT. <laughs> so that just goes to show you that if you're going to apply yourself to anything, despite the odds, there's no reason for you to not go for it. What if I never applied? I would have never gotten the chance to get in and go to this school with these weird dorm buildings. That top right picture, that's where I stayed. That was my dorm where I slept, ate, studied with my fellow classmates. It's called Simmons Hall. 
really weird. It also had a ball pit on the inside. The bottom right picture is me and my team who stayed up until who knows when, trying to get our robot to work in time for the competition. I remember going back to change to my red shirt and falling asleep in the bathroom on the toilet because that's how tired I was, but still making it back in time and realizing that this, this is the school that I want to go to. And so, of course, I applied for regular admission. I wanted to get into that school. I went from not knowing what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go to at least knowing I want to go to MIT. And I applied, and I got in, and I began my journey at this school. Now, MIT is a weird place. You saw my dorm. This top left corner is actually one of the buildings on campus where they're studying artificial intelligence, computer science. I even had my first physics classes in this building. And on the bottom left, what you're actually looking at here is a roller coaster built by students for incoming freshmen. This was a welcome to the school, a roller coaster. I did not get on it, but I did watch other people get on it. And then that picture on the right-hand side, that's our tallest building at MIT, called the Green Building. And what in the world is going on there? Uh, so you guys are too smart. <laughs> so, Tetris. But then I got to the school, and I realized I still didn't know what I wanted to do. So I signed up for an introductory class. So this is a class where basically you get to learn the basics of the subject before committing to it fully. And there were a large list of classes to choose from. I could become an electrical engineer, or a computer scientist, or a biological engineer, a civil engineer, a biological engineer. And then there was one called aerospace engineer. And I was like, I don't really know what that means, but I do know that space is cool. I was like, you guys, I thought space was pretty cool. So I went to the class. I went to the class, and the professor was going over the syllabus for the year. You know, when you start a new class and the teacher tells you what you're going to learn, he says, we're going to learn a little bit about rockets, we're going to learn a little bit about planes, and we're going to learn a little bit about the history of human space flight. And he shows this image on the board of an astronaut fixing the Hubble telescope. And I remember looking at this and thinking to myself, wow, this is what it's really about. And I remember growing up and thinking that anyone who said, I'm going to grow up to be an astronaut one day, you might as well say, I'm going to grow up to be a princess one day. It's the same. It's silly. Who does that? Well, people do it. And then my professor looked at me, and he said, I'm an astronaut in the picture. Yeah, I have the same reaction. Huh? I couldn't believe it. I went from never knowing anyone in my entire life who worked on anything space-related, or even worked for NASA, to be in the same room as an astronaut, someone who's into space, and he was my teacher. And it was right then and there that I said, oh, it's not easy. I'm going to be an aerospace engineer. <laughs> That's what I decided to study. And let me tell you, I was surrounded by classmates who were not surprised at all to know that our professor was an astronaut. They knew who he was, and they also knew since they were your age, they were going to become aerospace engineers and potentially astronauts one day. Some of my classmates, they could tell you every single rocket that America had ever built. They could look at a plane and tell you all of the models, the specs, everything. I even had classmates who were already pilots coming out of high school. And then there was me. I just chose it because my professor sounds cool. But I persevered. And as I started taking Classes, I started to learn about this magical place, three letters, JPL, my professors. Okay, let's pretend we're running a simulation. We need to land something on the surface of Mars, J. 
just like JPL. Let's say that we're sending a probe out of our solar system like JPL. JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of NASA's many centers based in California that is known for making robots that are used to explore space. And I got it into my head that JPL is where I wanted to work. So of course, when the career fair came around, I went straight up to the JPL booth. I'm ready. I got my resume in my hand. I'm excited. I hand it over. I wait a few weeks to hear back. Nothing. They didn't even tell me that I was rejected. They just didn't even call back. But that's OK. I was only in my second year of college. I had plenty of time to prove myself, join some clubs, learn even more, become a better candidate. And so that's what I did. And the next year I applied, rejected. Yeah. How many of you would have just given up? <laughs> yeah. That could really easily get into your head, right? And I had a lot of classmates around me who were getting those internships. So what's different between me and them? Well, maybe they're smarter. Maybe they're just better than me. But the one thing that I had was my ability to believe in myself. Listen, I had gotten this far, had I not? I didn't even know that MIT was a thing. And then I got accepted. So if that's possible, anything is. So I didn't give up on myself. I did the exact opposite. I reflected, what can I improve? You know what? What can I do so that JPL absolutely needs me, not just wants me? I continued with the club. I became a leader. I took classes that I didn't need to because I was interested in them. I found my passion and I followed it. And in the meantime, I also graduated as class of 2016 from MIT. This is a huge accomplishment for me. <laughs> and with that graduation, I also packed my bags so that I could move to Pasadena, California and start at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I didn't give up. I didn't give up. And because I didn't give up, I landed here. And look at this beautiful place. There's not a lot like it. It's located in Los Angeles, California, Pasadena specifically, on the side of some mountains. Because JPL actually started as three students at a university called Caltech who were playing around in the valley, seeing if they could actually send something into space. And because they were afraid they might blow something up, the college said, you can do it, but not here. You need to go out there. And that's where JPL still stays today. And at JPL, I found my place. This is me taking a selfie with one of JPL's many rovers. But this is one of its engineering models, what we call its twin. Because its actual, the actual model is right now on Mars, roving around, collecting really interesting science data. This one here on the ground is used like people like me, engineers, who want to test things out before doing them for real. Because in space, if something goes wrong, guess what? This is going to pick you up. If you knock your rover over or your car breaks down, who's going to hit you? No one. Exactly. No one. So you better be careful. Test as much as possible. And at this point, my journey has brought me from New Jersey to Massachusetts, and now to California. But this was just the beginning of my journey. Because this is also when I learned that I was going to become an instrument operations engineer. You all know what that is, right? Raise your hand when you know what that is. Awesome, huh? I wasn't expecting any hands, because when I got this job offer and they said I was going to be an instrument operations engineer, I said, yeah, sign my name. First day, rolling up to JPL, I said, what have I done? What in the world is an instrument operations engineer? I'm going to walk in this building, and they're going to find out I am a fraud. I don't even know what my job title means. 
But I very quickly found out what it meant. It meant that I had one of the coolest jobs in the world. Because an instrument operations engineer, their home is known as the Mission Control Center. And you can see in this picture, my face is pretty dark, but that is me sitting in this place where all data comes. And the instrument part of the title describes what I am operating in space, the instruments. And these are not musical instruments. These are science instruments, instruments that tell us more about the places that we go, the questions that the scientists have. What is this? How old is it? When did this form? We answer them with scientific instruments. And then we have the spacecraft, which is like the vehicle. They get you from point A to point B in one piece and keeps you alive for the whole journey. So it's basically my job to operate the science instruments. And I did it from the center of the universe. There's an actual plaque in the Mission Control Center at JPL that says this, center of the universe because almost all data going from the moon and onwards flows through this very room. It's a very special place to work. And if you're wondering, well, how in the world does all this happen? Well, it happens by communicating with the spacecraft from here on Earth, with me, an operator. But instead of talking to these spacecraft and these instruments with human language, we talk to them in ones and zeros, computer language, binary, bits. And those ones and zeros can be translated into actual messages, like JPL's motto, Dare Mighty Things. And the other half of my job is not just talking to the spacecraft and telling it what to do, or commanding it, as we say, but also getting back data from it, what we call telemetry, that lets us know how the spacecraft and its instruments are performing. But instead of us having the spacecraft tells exactly what's going on, and instead gives us these plots, these colors, the greens, the reds, the numbers, the voltages, the currents, the temperatures. And from this, we have to understand what's going on. It's my job to be an investigator, put on my investigative hat, or be a doctor and diagnose what's going on with my patient, the spacecraft. And in my time at JPL, I got to work at many missions five missions to be exact. These pictures that you see in the background here, these are real images. Real images from the first mission I ever worked on called the Cassini Mission to Saturn. And that trophy that I'm holding in my hand, never thought that as an engineer I would hold this, is actually an Emmy Award for videos put out by our project. Wow, what a cool accomplishment. I never really thought I'd have something like this as an engineer, but this was my reality. Now, uh, besides Cassini, I also worked for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, using instruments to understand the surface temperature of the moon. I also worked on Maya, or the multi-angle imager for aerosols, that's going to teach us more about pollution in cities all around the world. Sentinel-6 and SWAT, measuring the ways that our ocean levels are changing. These projects were incredible, and they started my career in space. But what I never would have expected was this. Why am I here? Have anyone heard of that song, uh, not song, that show, Why Did You Come to Japan? Okay, I'm glad you heard that. When I arrived at the airport, there were some guys looking at me with a camera, and they said, why did you come to Japan? I was like, wow, what a deep question. I just arrived. <laughs> this is a good question, why did I come? Why did I quit my job at NASA, my dream job, to come to Japan? And the answer is I came for a lot of reasons. I came because I wanted something new. We only have one life to live. And guess what? Your life is not just your accomplishments. Your life is also about experiences. And I wanted to experience something new. And not just new, but something that would challenge me. Moving to Japan and to experiencing a new culture and then experiencing a new career alongside people from all around the world, it meant giving up my dream position at NASA to see if I could challenge myself and overcome once again. And it meant living a life that was meant for poor fulfillment. 
Because even when you reach your dreams, you may realize at some point after that you're still not satisfied. My dream was to get to MIT, and then I got to MIT, and now what? My dream was to graduate from MIT, and then I graduated, now what? Then it was to work at NASA, now what? There's always some kind of now what? And for me, the opportunity to come and continue my career in space in Tokyo, Japan? I was not going to pass that up. That was a yes for me. So I moved here and I started and continued my career, this time with a brand new shiny title, Senior Mission Operations Engineer. This is what I do here in Tokyo. Very similar to my last title as an Instrument Operations Engineer, except for now I'm at the mission level. That means I care not just about the science instruments, but also about the spacecraft, and also about how we plan on getting where we're going, and all those little details in between. This was the start of something new for me. And in this picture, I'm actually in our mission control, located here in Tokyo, Nihonbashi, to be specific, actually. And as part of that, I also became what is known as a flight director. Uh, my job as a flight director was to wear many hats. One, I needed to become what is known as a critical thinker. Because in the mission control center, as a flight director, you are the ultimate responsible engineer for the mission. That means if something goes wrong, everyone turns and looks to you. And it is also your responsibility to act in a way that makes sense. You cannot panic, you cannot rush. The first time I ran into issues on console in the Mission Control Center, I had engineers shouting crazy things at me. Oh my gosh, just turn it off and turn it back on. Oh, did you try this? Did you try that? Like, breathe. We're gonna breathe first. Let's go at this logically, step by step, diagnose the problem in a way that actually makes sense work together as a team to come to a solution we can all agree to. That was my job as a flight director. And being a flight director has led me on an amazing journey. It has taught me so many things about myself and about the people around me. And it has ultimately landed into moments like this. This is a real picture that one of my missions took of us, the Earth. It's called an Earth rise picture. The Earth comes over the horizon of the moon. And there's a black dot on the Earth. If you look closely, there's a black dot. And that black dot, I found out, it's a solar eclipse happening over Australia. This is a one-of-a-kind photo. And I was there for that. Really magical moment in God. So it just goes to say that this job may be stressful at times, but it's absolutely so, so worth it. And what else is worth it? is this. All the moments in between, the times when I've got to meet with students and share my story, the times when I've gotten to engage with my community and give back, because what is the point of getting this far if it's not to pull others up along with you on the journey so that I can see all of you working alongside me one day and being my boss? I'm ready for that too. So with that, I'd like to give special thanks to my friend, Sabrina Thompson, who designed the suit that I am wearing today. She is a woman who also works for NASA and is also into fashion and has designed suits for pilots and astronauts to actually wear and gifted this one to me, which is super nice. So let's take your questions.
And I took this class because it sounded cool. And I was also a little bit of a math nerd. And I wanted to see what it was all about. And basically what I learned is that, yes, there is actually more than one infinity. Maybe not the ones that you're talking about, but we talked about that type too. In math, you have different kinds of infinity, and we were given a lot of problems about infinity to think about. Like pi, yes, exactly, concepts like this. Like, if you were standing in an infinite line of people, and each of you had on either a red hat or a black hat, but no one could see their own hat, how can you guess what color yours is? These things were messing with my head. And that's when I learned that concepts like infinity and thinking of different timelines and paths, they're all actually rooted in mathematics, pure mathematics. And the graduate students who were taking the class with me made me realize that this goes a lot deeper than I thought. And as a freshman, this class is probably a little bit beyond me. But I love her already thinking about it. So please keep on, because there is definitely more infinities out there. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I remember you had your hand up second. Oh, would I ever want to go to space? I remember when I was walking in today, one of the students asked me if I'd been to space, and when I said no, he got very upset. <laughs> Disappointed, I should say. I get it, I get it. You know, my professor went to space, well, why haven't I? Honestly, if I had gone to space, I would have been one of the youngest people ever to do that. Uh, going to space is a big deal. You don't just go to space. In fact, you have to apply to become an astronaut, and to do that, you need your master's degree. You also need to be pretty dang good at what you do. And one of the past astronaut classes, you know one of the people they admitted was a Navy SEAL, MIT engineer, Harvard graduate doctor. This is the caliber of astronauts that NASA is really looking for. But the reason why I haven't been to space, or I'm actually not even planning to go right now, is not because I think it's too hard or impossible. We've already talked about how things like that, it's not a thing, nothing's impossible. But it's because I've learned that I work best here on the ground, operating and helping people who are out there. Now, I never worked a mission with people. I worked missions with robots. And maybe one day, I will help out astronauts as they go on and forward to explore places like the moon or Mars. Okay, uh, teachers, I have not been paying attention, and I want to be fair and spread the love. Okay. Do you believe that there's other life um, in the universe? Great question. Do I believe there's other life in our universe? The answer is, quite simply, Yes, and let me tell you why. So when I was working on that Cassini mission to Saturn, it wasn't just for kicks and giggles. We had scientists who had sent us there with actual goals in mind. One of Saturn's moons is known as Enceladus. Now Saturn has more than 60 moons, and Enceladus is quite special among them because it has on top of its surface an icy crust. So ice, like if you wanted to, you can go ice skating on top. And as part of this ice crust, there are also geysers like Old Faithful in our national parks in America. Basically, imagine these huge plumes shooting out organic matter in the form of ice crystals and water. Ice, water, H2O on a moon in our own solar system. And where there is water, there is yeah, you guys have been paying attention. <laughs> exactly. So, not only have we found traces of water, not even traces, much proof of water on this moon, we've also found other water moons in Jupiter. There's a mission called Europa that's planning to explore this further very soon. And also on Mars. Not just traces of water from the past, but actual water could be there right now. So maybe not aliens, maybe not green little men, Maybe not that kind of life, but I do believe that we at the least may have some form of microorganisms, small life, just in our own backyard. Great question. Science and 
have a faith that religion has no place in it, or this idea of a greater being has no place in it. In fact, I work on a committee that looks for people who are really excellent at doing science communication. That means spreading the word about science with the general public, like people like me and you. And one of the people who won this competition this past year, his entire submission was about religion and science, and how do these two things coexist? For me, I grew up Christian, and still a Christian to this day. I believe in God. And in fact, I think the more I've learned about our universe and how absolutely crazy it is out there, how complicated, how vast, how endless, how impossible it is for us as humans to ever fully grasp it, and it's only brought it home to me that it had to be a, a higher power that has done it and has made it so. But no matter what you believe in, I believe that you don't have to stop believing in God at the very least in order to pursue science, just like me. So thank you, everybody.